Good morning. Good morning, everybody. So I want you to, if you're online, if you're with us right now, on my way back, I did some work. Sorry, I can take this off. Might be better. Get used to it, don't we? I went and done, I did a little bit of, uh, of work over in Pampa, Texas. So I don't know if you're watching us from Pampa, Texas. It's, it's really in the middle of the panhandle, out far from really anything. But coming back, we decide to drive back. And I want you to picture this with me because I want you to picture your own scenario. We're on our way back. I couldn't leave until my shift was over. So the sun is setting as we're coming on the way back. And everything that you've sung this morning, I don't know if you paid attention to the words, if something was bothering you, or maybe you were just adjusting to church. That, that time when you first come in to sing, it's a time for you to reflect and, and to look and to, to receive some truth. Even in the, in the singing, there's gospel truth all throughout that. And I want to say this morning, thank you to the worship team, because that was a lot of truth in those songs. And I don't know if you caught it all, but we're going to try to cover some of it today. And so on the way back from Pampa, Texas... We're coming back, we're driving at night, and the sun is setting, and it is a West Texas, as flat as the earth can be. If you've ever been to West Texas, you know how flat it is out there. So it's just as flat as it can be, and we come across an area that has these, these gulches and these little ravines and these little areas of this valley, and we're passing by that as the sun is setting, and, you know, and it's, it's just like a, a, a scene from Mars or something that you would imagine you see on a movie or on, on a Mars landing rover. So it's this rugged-looking valley, cliffs, and in the distance, you can see the flat line that's going across. And then even then, you can see, and I point to Rachel, and I say, oh, look, 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 isn't that the most brilliant, you know, I'm like, look at that sunset. That's just a pure, beautiful West Texas sunset. I mean, it was out of this world majestic. It's so flat that the sunset just covers the whole span of your vision. And then in the distance, you can see the heads of some deer. And so it's just this, this capturing sunset that we were looking at as we were on our way back. Rachel went with me that way. I want you to think about this evening, or this morning, as we sang today. A billion stars created within a breath of our almighty God, right? I want you to think about the best sunset you ever saw. The best sunset you've seen, the best sunset, whether it's on a, a beach, I don't know, I've never been to Maui, but a, a Maui beach sunset whether it's in the Caribbean, wherever your best sunset is, I want you to think about that. If you're out there with us and and, and you're joining us online, I want you to think about that. Because here's the truth of it. The God that made that sunset we just sang is the God that has your back. The God that made that sunset is the God that loves you, is the God that has created you in the same way he created that brilliant sunset that God created you. That God created you, and he knew you, and he loved you even before you were born, the scripture tells us. Can you imagine? So just, we're going to take a moment of silence, whether you're at home or now. Everybody is stressed. Everybody is anxious because we're worried about loved ones and family members and this COVID virus and all of these things going on. But I want you to sit, and I want you to sit upon and meditate upon the power of the God that loves you. The God who can put a sunset together that will just forever burn in your memory. The God who will, who will put something in your life of incredible beauty that if you would just take the time, he would reassure you and say, I'm here. I'm here for you. <laughs> Lord Jesus says, we hear as you do in Northside, Lord. The rooster crow here, if you're not on life, the Lord hears all things, Lord. As that rooster crows, it's morning, God. And Lord, we, we come to you today, Father, and, and Lord, we just lift this time up together, Father. We lift up our pastors, Aaron, who's recovering, Lord, and his wife, who's recovering, Father, to, the, to the, even, Father, the family, Lord, that they've gone through so much in this season, Lord. We lift up to you, Pastor Mario, and... Mirena and the boys, Lord, and, and, and in this season, Father, having to bear the burden of leading a church, but yet, Lord, having a flock, Lord, that is dispersed around the countryside and who knows where, Father, and the heart and the desire that goes into just loving people, Lord, wherever they may be. We lift up to you, Lord, right now, those members of our church, those people who are connected to those members of our church who are in health crisis, Lord, 
whether it's mental health crisis, whether it's physical crisis, Father, we, we stand, God. As you speak, Father, may you speak. As you say, Father, may you say, and Lord, as your word speaks, may it speak more than I can speak, Lord. And as your breath moves, Father, through us, Father, may we subtly, but Lord, may we dearly hold on to the truth of the gospel. For it is, Lord, the power to save. We lift these things to you in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, I sent out a survey earlier this week, and it's on our Waves members communication page. If you didn't fill it out, it's okay. I have enough people who filled it out. We're going to be talking today. As we met with the elders and and Pastor Mario, and we started to look at things, we really had to come back to what is it that we're about here at Waves? What is it that we're about? In this season, one of the things you have to do in a season like this where there's crisis and there's health and there's life and death all around you, what you have to do is come back and say, why? Why God? You know, how is kind of a scientific question. Why is a spiritual question? And you have to come back to yourself and you say, how? And as a church, I think God is using this season to prune the church. Statistically right now, attendance in the United States in churches is down. Giving is down. Everything is down. But I think God is using this this, this season to prune his church. What you'll see come out of this season are those who have laid hold of the gospel of Jesus Christ for what it is, the power that it brings, the life that it brings, and you'll see those who, not so much, are not followers of Jesus Christ. And I'm going to say that. I know that you may be out there, you may disagree, but I challenge you to prove to me otherwise. This is the gospel time, folks. We're seeing a change in administration for whether, whether you believe or whatever you may believe about politics, it's going to change a lot because we're swinging from one side to another. Are you ready? We're seeing a change in our culture. As culture starts to shift around, we have now moved in from a pre-Renaissance, pre-Enlightenment to an Enlightenment to now a postmodern phase in the Western world. Are you ready? We have moved into a a, a culture and a society that used to use Scripture to educate our youngins and now berates Scripture and ridicules and mocks Scripture within even our highest academic circles. Are you ready? Are you ready for what will become of the church from 2021 to the future? The church is going to see a revelation and yet also a trying that I think it has never seen before in the United States. Are you ready? Today we're going to start with the first value of ways of faith. It's called Christology. It's the study of Jesus. It's who Jesus is. Because if you study Jesus, then you're going to understand the gospel. And if you understand the gospel, then you're going to get the gospel out. And if you understand how to get the gospel out, you're going to bring something that saves and changes neighborhoods, changes communities, changes lives. So are you ready to do that? I want to challenge you today. I sent out that survey, and my concern about that survey is, unfortunately, as much as we might think that at Ways of Faith we have the best teaching, unfortunately at Ways of Faith, no matter how we think that we might have the best systems in place, we still fall within the same culture that is happening in the American church today. We still fall. When I read that survey, I'm like, oh my gosh, there are some people who don't understand who Jesus is. And yet every Sunday we sing about a billion things that God can do in an instant, and yet we don't. And if you don't know who Jesus is, then all of those things we sang up there couldn't be possible if the gospel of Jesus as written in Scripture is not true. Do you understand that? Whatever we just sang today was just words and meant nothing and has no power within it if we do not subscribe to the Jesus of the Bible. Do you understand that? If you're listening to me out there, whomever filled it out, whomever was struggling with faith because I read those survey, I read the survey, if you're out there and you do not subscribe to the Bible of Jesus Christ, the, the, the Jesus Christ of the scripture, we're going to talk about today how that makes an impact and how it could be an impact in your life. So this is a lot. Prob- I don't get nervous on a lot of messages, but this one makes me nervous. 
I was nervous about this message because for me as someone representing Jesus up here, I have to be as accurate as possible when I speak about the Lord Jesus himself. I am accountable for every word that I say this morning. I will be judged by God on that word. And I pray this morning that what I say and and what I convey to you is pure scriptural truth and nothing about what Sonny wants or Sonny thinks or Sonny believes, but all about what God and who God is. So let's jump into this. This is very complex. Jesus is our message. That's our first core value, okay? If you want to know what Waves of Faith is about as a church, we have people come here, we have people who work at Waves of Faith. If you're employed by Waves of Faith, if you are subtly trying to get into Waves of Faith, figure out what we are, if you are a member and you've been here for many, many years, if you are just an attender, whomever you are, it is very important that you know today that Jesus is our message. Jesus is our message. And I know that's simple. Probably what I, what I cover with you guys today is not going to be a lot of complicated things, but it is going to be very substantial, very fundamental to what we need to believe. And so I'm going to cover that. You're going to hear words like crystal, Christocentric. You're going to hear words like person centric. You're going to hear words like historical Jesus versus biblical Jesus. I'm going to give you some terms out there already. Pluralism versus true deism. And we're going to talk about some extreme concepts for you to understand who Jesus is, because if you don't get Jesus right, you don't get it. And I will say that out there. If you don't get Jesus right, you don't get it. So let's talk about that. And, you know, Rachel and I have been doing marriage uh, seminars for eons. In fact, we recently got a... um, We have been doing it so long that the group that we work with actually sent us a prototype of one of the uh, events that they will be producing in the future. So we're actually a test couple for a prototype for this this fantastic group of believers who run this marriage enrichment uh, program. So we have the prototype, you know, and we pulled out the prototype. It's all pretty packaged. They got it all nice and, and pretty, and, and we started going through the, the, the system that they're doing to teach you a little bit about Jesus and, and marriage and all that good stuff. So we're working through the prototypes and flipping the cards. But, you know, not too long ago, we went to the last conference. I think it might have been 2017. I don't, I don't, I'm not, not quite sure. Maybe 2016. So we had been going to this conference, this marriage conference, probably for some out of a 10-year period, eight, eight years, consistently we got involved. We were part of the prayer team. We would go set up. We would pray with them. They, I mean, they have a system where six months before event, you're praying together. Four months before event, you're praying together. And then once the event starts, you're in the back as a participant, as a, as a supporter. You're in the 24-7 prayer room that's going on in the midst of the convention. You're praying constantly. And you're reading these cards about couples that are just falling apart. You're reading these cards about people in desperate situations. And, and you're on your knees and you're praying. And they're sitting in that conference listening. And so you know that the, the prayer that you're giving out is so crucial to the intervention of God in the life of the people that are there. And so I remember in the last one we went to, or maybe it was the first before the last. I don't know. Rachel can tell you the real details. I give you the general idea. But they make you write this love letter to each other. It's kind of like this is where we are, and this is where we, this is us together. And I remember when we first started going, our love letters were so distant. They were so, we, you know, we had no idea who the other was like or what the other was like. And our love letters were, were just different needs, different understandings, different, different ways of wanting to relate. And it was just like way out there. And we, kept, we would, every year we would do the love letter and we kind of like, you know, are you sure? You know, I get a little anxious about writing the love letter. I'm like, oh gosh, I don't know if, if, if I don't know if I get her yet. And every year we'd write these love letters, and I think Rachel was sharing not this week even just this last time we wrote the love letter. It was as if we copied each other's love letter. Folks, I think that's somewhere around 16, 17 years of marriage it took us to get there. So if you're struggling right now in your marriage, it took us 16 to 17, and some of you are smarter than we are, some of you are more savvy than we are. You probably can get there a lot quicker than we can. But it took us 16 to 17 years. That's, you know, we have kids that are teenagers. It took us until the teeny part of our marriage to be on the same page. The reason I share that story with you is if you're going to know Jesus, 
If you're going to be able to write a love letter that God has written to you, it's going to take you knowing Jesus of the Bible. So it's important that you understand who Jesus is because you won't know Jesus if you don't understand him and you don't understand him unless you read the scripture. As we think about it, there's a long, a lot of Bible verses and passages. But I first want to read to you Mark chapter 8. This is the, cu- the culmination of what we're talking about. In Mark chapter 8, many of you have read this before. But it says, And Jesus went on with his disciples to the village of Caesarea Philippi, and on the way he asked his disciples. So think about this. This is Jesus who has been with his disciples probably somewhere at least a year or so or more. So he's been walking with his disciples. These are the, uh, the people that are walking with Jesus literally. And he says, who do people say I am? Who do people say I am? Who, who, when you look out into our world, when you look into our culture, when you look at your cousins and your brothers and your aunts and your uncles and your distant family members, your friends, your community of, of friendship, your coworkers, who do they say that I am? And they told him. Some said John the Baptist. Some say Elijah. Others say one of the prophets. And he asked them, but who do you say I am? If you're out there, the ultimate question you're going to be asked in the eternity of man is who is Jesus? It's not going to be how good you were. It's not going to be how much money you made. It's not going to be how much you gave to the poor. It's not going to be how many things you did for for the poor. It's going to be who do you say Jesus is? So Jesus turns to his disciples and he says, who do you say that I am? And Peter said it. Peter said, you are are the Christ. And he strictly charged them to tell no one about him. See, when Jesus first oriented the disciples, he had to have them know who he was. If you're coming to Waves, if you're going to be a part of Waves, if if you want to know what Waves is about, then you need to know who Jesus is because Jesus is our message. And in no other person, in no other thing, and in no other idea, in no other philosophy do we sit other than Jesus Christ, the Son of God himself. So I know, simple concept, right? Simple but always complex. So here's my first statement to you. Who is Jesus? Jesus is the Son of God. Part of the Trinity, who is one with the Father and the Holy Spirit, he is God. Okay? If you're going to know something, you have to spend time with it. For me to know Rachel, for us to get our love letters finally together, guess what had to happen? For me, a slow learner, right? I always tell people in college I had to read the book three times. Three times before I got it. I was a slow learner. For me to know Rachel, it took me 16 to 17 years of work and stress and love and all of that good stuff to learn who she was. If you're going to know who Jesus is, Scripture is your answer. There's two kinds of concepts going right now. And many of you like to watch the National Geographic channel you, or any of these other channels. And you'll notice around Easter and around Christmas, they start showing all these movies and TV shows and these experts and these expositionals and these uh, biographies. And they'll say, who is Jesus? The lost letter of Jesus. Jesus' little lost brother. Jesus' lost child. Jesus' marriage that didn't pan out. And you're, you're listening to all of these stories. And a lot of the world is believing this. But if you're going to be a biblical person, Jesus is not defined historically. Jesus is defined biblically. Point number one for you. Jesus must be defined biblically, not historically. In academia, they're going to say that. Why do they want to say that? Because there has been a shift in our culture. Did you know that they surveyed preachers and ministers, and many believe that the scripture is not true. In our church, in our survey, several of you out there believe that the word of God is not true, that it's just a good guide. When Jesus asked them, who do I am? They say, well, he's a good guy. He's a prophet. He's a nice guy. Jesus, is a, he's an all right guy. You know what I mean? He's my homie, you know. But if you're going to be a biblical person, you have to believe that scripture is true. And that's what we believe here at Waves. And because of that fundamental truth, we believe that Jesus defines himself in the scripture. 
It's great to have archaeology, and it may, co- and it may coincide, but when archaeology doesn't consistently fall within what the Bible says who Jesus is, then we reject it. We reject it. Listen to that. When something outside of science of discovery does not jive, does not fit in with what the Bible says who Jesus is, we reject it. And we look for a better answer to describe that. What was the latest news that they found? They may have found Jesus' home in Nazareth. If it doesn't fit the scripture, then we reject it. So when you get a Dan Brown book that says that Jesus actually had a secret wife and he had secret children and this is the whole discovery, this is the uh, Da Vinci Code, when it does not fit, and many Christians believe the Da Vinci Code, when it does not fit the biblical Jesus, what do you do? You reject it. Do you understand that, church? As a ways of faith teaching, we believe if the Pope, and I'm going to step on some toes here, if the Pope says something that is not the biblical Jesus, we reject it. The biblical Jesus is the Jesus that God gave us. God gave us the word, and through the word, we receive the truth of who Christ is. Do you guys get that? So when we read the scripture, it defines him as the son of God. And in Scripture, we understand. We put labels on things in Scriptures only because we have to define something within the Bible that is revealed. So what you need to know is that God reveals himself through the Scripture. Okay? Through the Bible. God reveals himself through the Bible. So what does culture, society want to do? Well, they know that's a tenet to believing in a true Jesus Christ. And when they don't want to believe in Jesus Christ, then what they have to do is they have to destroy the Bible. They have to say, well, it's errant. It's got incorrections. It's got, a, it's got a spelling mistake right here. Or it's got this mistake right here. And they'll destroy Scripture and they'll use circumferential things to try to disprove Scripture because they're trying to disprove the Jesus of the Bible. If I can undo Scripture, then Jesus becomes subjective to what I want to believe. Do you know what that means? That means I get to define Jesus. And what you have seen in the last two to three hundred years, even though America is a great country and we're an independent country and believe in freedom, freedom is given by God for sure. What we have embraced, though, is an individualism that says everything is defined by me and at my pleasure, which is antithetical to the scripture, which says that everything is for God's pleasure. Do you get that? And we wonder why. How does this impact your life? Well, we wonder why. When we seek our own pleasure, things get messed up. Right? You're like, well, it's, you know, it's my pleasure, but then it gets all messed up. And yet, God says, no, it's for my pleasures that things are done. And when we understand that connection, then the things we do are more about pleasing God than pleasing ourselves. Do you see how that plays, how that theology plays into actual practice of life? I did a question this week. And my question this week was really simple, and you answer it yourself. I put a question on my own Facebook page, and it said this, which statement is more true for you in your belief system, that I know more about God by knowing myself or that I know more about God by knowing God? I know more about myself by knowing God. I'll repeat it. I know more about God by knowing myself or I know more about myself by knowing God. It is a deep philosophical truth question of where you sit in your belief system. If you define God based on how you know yourself, then you are very centric to your theology. Everything you're going to believe comes about with who you are and what you are and how you feel and where you want to go and what you want to do. It becomes very centric to your person. It is your nature. But if you believe that you can only know you Remember, the greatest writings of Christianity were saying, we only know us if we know who God is. Then your thinking becomes, what does God say? What does God teach? What does God tell me about me? What does God say? Does God say that I'm a loser? No, God doesn't say I'm a loser. God says that I am loved, that I am bought for, that he paid the ultimate price I define myself by God. What does God say about me? God says that I made you and I created you in the beauty of your womb. In the womb, I made you. I made you as as my servant. And so then you understand who you are. 
when you let God define who you are, it changes your real life situation. It changes your real life situation. How many of you have gone along in life and you've listened to people tell you who you are? And for so many believers, they struggle. Guess why you struggle? Because you define your life by yourself in Christ versus defining your life with who God says you are. God says, you've been made more than conquerors. God says, if you sit and you agree with me, then whatever you say will be bound on heaven and bound on earth. Do you understand as a believer who God says you are? And so as we look, Jesus said, I am the son of God. And what we believe and we understand and we apply this word, the Trinity to it, because it's what can encapsulate this understanding of who Jesus defined himself to be. He said, I am God. I and the Father are one. There is this thing called the Trinity. It's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And they are God. There is one God, only one God. But in that God is a relational person of the Father and Son of the Holy Spirit. It makes so much sense, though, when you read in the New Testament versus the Old Testament that he proclaimed forever in glory and in eternity that he was the son of God and then he became a son of man do you see the connection why Jesus would become the son of man so that he could take on the full nature of humanity he could live in humanity he could conquer humanity he could die and resurrect and bear the burden that we would have borne the judgment that we would have had it makes sense that the God of eternity would say that I am the son of God and so that he becomes the son of man born to die for our sin. See, the Bible is congruent. That means it fits. It's not a tricky book. It works its way through truth. So we know that Jesus, right, he is the son of God. What else do we know about him? We know he came, he died, he rose again, right? He lived the perfect life. He was born of a virgin, all of that good old-fashioned creed that we might sing. We know that. Bring up the next, next one. I'm going to read a few more scriptures. He has existed and always as part of God's redemption plan was born of a virgin to become fully man, living perfect in human flesh and nature. He became the atoning sacrifice for our sin. He died and resurrected to conquer death. Why is that important? We just sang three songs. These songs talked about the power within our faith if we believe historical Jesus, what society, academia, all of the world is trying to redefine Jesus and has been doing since the beginning, and we reject the scriptural Jesus, then what happens to this verse is, you've heard this on TV, you've seen it on TV, it comes on Life magazine, on People magazine, it comes on National Geographic, that Jesus really, it could, he couldn't have been born of a virgin. Well, the word virgin kind of means this thing or that thing, or it begins to become redefined because when you take away the power of God to come into humanity and to be born so that he's fully God and he's fully man, but yet retaining his power as God, because if he was born purely as man, he had no power. But he was born fully God, fully man now to be able, through a virgin birth, to be able to do the things that he did in the power of God the Father. Does that make sense to you? And some of this is really complicated, and you may not believe. I'm not forcing you to believe, but I'm just reorienting you to who Jesus is. Do you accept Jesus of the Scripture, or do you accept Jesus of historical models, because that defines where you go with this. If you cannot understand that, come talk to us. We can sit and we can talk, we can discuss. We're always open to that. But it's only because he is God born of flesh that he is able to conquer death in the perfectness of who he is. And when you destroy that, then there is no power in Jesus. Paul said that. Paul said if Jesus wasn't really these things, then all we worship is another dude. How many want to worship another dude or another dudette, right? Pick someone in here that you would love to worship, right? Hopefully you guys are saying the one next to you. You know, we worship our mom or we worship our... Who would you like to worship? 
You might as well worship something else if Jesus isn't the Jesus of the Bible. Because then if he's not the Jesus of the Bible, he has no power. He has no authority. He can do nothing more for you than I can for you. And maybe I can do a little even more. But if he's the Jesus of the Bible, I could never even touch the hem of his garment. So, important. Important that you understand. Let's go on to the next one. It's important that we understand, church, as we come together and as we work together, we have to have the same base. And some of you are going to struggle today. Some of you are going to leave, and you're going to be, I don't know. I don't know that I really believe in Jesus. Because when I read that survey, some of you don't believe this at all. You don't believe Jesus was born per, of a virgin. You don't believe that Jesus, that the scripture is, is infallible, that it's true to what it says. And you don't define Jesus within this context. And then you struggle with this Christian thing. That's what I'm trying to get to, is you struggle with living in a faith that you don't even really believe in. If you're uncomfortable right now, that's good. That's the Holy Spirit speaking to you. If you're out of place, that's good, because that's God speaking to you, saying, I am showing you who I am today. You will serve me or you will not. And that's okay. That's your choice. Who is Jesus? He is the Son of God, part of the Trinity, a one with the Father and Holy Spirit. He is God, Son in eternity and human nature. That is who he is. And as we read these scriptures, there's quite a few of them. I think when I gave this message to Rachel, I was a little afraid because she kind of always gives me that look like, are you sure about all these verses? So I did my best, Rachel, so... As we move on, I want you to think about that. I want you to think about who Jesus is. The Bible says in Psalms 2-7, I will tell of the decree the Lord said to me, you are my son today, I have begotten you. Even in the Old Testament, it was already beginning, right? All the prophecies, all the predictions, the waiting of the Messiah, it was all beginning to predict who Jesus would become and who he would be. And already the plan was that the Son of God would come to earth to be the Son of Man to die for you and my sin. He would be not the first Adam, he would be the second Adam. He would not be like the great prophet Moses or Elijah. He would be superior to the prophets. The reason that in the New Testament we refer to him as we refer to Moses, and the reason he says, some say he's Moses, some say he's Elijah, some say he's a great prophet, some say he's this or that, is because what Jesus was saying is, I am none of that. I am above that. I am the Son of God. I am God. He said, if you have seen the Lord, you have seen me. I and the Father are one. He didn't say, you know, we're good buddies. We collaborate. He said, I and the Father are one. Jesus identifies himself as God the Son. And when he said that, the Bible says the Jews picked up some stones and they wanted to, to, to kill him. The reason why we know the biblical Jesus is true is because, and when you read somebody slick with their mouth, it's going to tell you, well, Jesus was, really wasn't God. I don't know about the Bible. It's kind of exaggerating. It's a great myth. You, in your culture right now, when you go to college and you go to universities, if they are non-biblical, they're going to tell you the myth of Christianity now. That's the new term. They've put it alongside the Greek myths, the Roman myths. If you're going to send your school kid to a university, make sure you have grounded them well because they will leave the faith. Statistically, parents have not prepared their children to go to universities, and their children will walk away from the faith because they will be asked questions by a slight tongue who will say, eh, the Bible's not really that true. Guess who else did that in the Garden of Eden? Did not God say? The greatest method that Satan has to deceive people is to bend the truth. And if your children aren't grounded in biblical truth, when they get out to a university where men and women hate God, I went to conferences at UT. I'm not trying to disparage UT, but it was just held at UT. I went to conferences where all of the liberal universities came. I mean, all the big ones, Harvard, UCLA, Stanford. They were all there, and I sat there, and I heard them just berate Jesus Christ, berate God in their professional literature academic presentations. And I sat there, and I was like, oh, my. Oh, my. Oh, my. I'm like, tears, tears. 
But thank God I was at the university I was at. Because at the university I was, I was taking New Testament, I was taking theology, I was taking philosophy. So I'm like, eh. And then plus, as a young believer, I had already begun to answer the hard questions in my faith. Don't throw your kids to the wolves is what I'm telling you. Unless you put some armor on them. Because they, they will leave the faith. Statistically, they will leave the faith. And so, you need to know who Jesus is. See, being God, he's the only He's the holy creator who relates and loves humanity. In the person of the Trinity, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit is a relational existence in the Holy Spirit, right? Jesus would always say, but what the Father says, I'll do. And the Father said, well, Jesus is my son, and he obeys me to the nth end. He, he does not disobey me. It is a relational system. And see, what we understand about God is that God is relational. Isn't that a beauty thing to know? The deists in the 1800s, uh, I mean the 1700s, 1600s, what they would say is that eh, God just wound the clock up and then he let it go and he never cares anymore about humankind. But the scripture, if it doesn't sync with scripture, you reject it. And say, great, I great, Thomas Jefferson's a great man. He's a historical and crucial to the United States Constitution as well as many of the other writers of the Constitution. But they did not believe in a Jesus that changes the world, that changes life. Voltaire, Locke, all of your philosophies of enlightenment. But the Jesus of the Bible, when it doesn't fit, we say, hey, that doesn't fit. See, Jesus was the creator. And see, they, they latched a little bit onto it, right? Because they said, what did they lay the whole constitution on? That we are endowed by whom? Creator. So they knew of a God, but they really felt like God just kind of put us on earth, wound up the clock, and is letting it run. And maybe that's what you believe. You're more of that deistic philosophy. But that's not the God, again, of the Bible. Because Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, through the Father, in that trinity, reveals to us that God has always been, always was. Jesus always was. He, didn't, he was not created. And that was another question on that survey. Some of you believe Jesus was created. Jesus has always been. He is God. He is from, he is from eternity to eternity with never a death in his path. That might be big to wrap your head around. The Bible does say that there are things that are so big that human man, mind cannot understand. But it's what God says who he is, right? We're, we're defining Jesus be based on who he said he was. Even if the concept is bigger than what we can understand. Does that make sense? So I, under, I, I give room for misunderstanding or confusion or challenging to believe this discomfort. If you're not discomforted right now then, uh, then uh, either you really agree with me or you're blowing me off. So either one is fine. Also, he is just and possesses the authority to judge the world. Remember what Jesus said, right? He said, I could call down a thousand angels, right? I could, call, I could call down angels that would destroy the world in a minute if I wanted to. Within God is the power to judge us rightly. Is to judge us right. And see, God is the ultimate judge. When people ask you the hard questions like, well, what about this person over here who did this? How are they going to go to hell? I'm like, I don't know, but I know what God says. I know that those who seek after him will find him. He tells me that in scripture. So if you want me to answer about somebody in some part of the world that doesn't know Jesus because they just don't know, I don't know, but I know that Jesus says that if those who seek him, they will find him, then there is a method for Jesus to reveal himself to them. I lay in the confidence. See, I could define it, right? The world is trying to destroy my belief in Jesus by saying, but what if? What if this circumstance? What if? What if? And I say, no, but it doesn't sit with what Jesus said. Do you understand how that changes? It also changes me because I realize now my job, one of my callings in the Bible is to do what? Is to take the gospel everywhere. China, India, whoever you want to go, Alaska, wherever you want to go, your job as a Christian is to take the gospel wherever you can take the gospel. So the Bible says, then being then God's offspring, we ought not to think about the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art, by the art and image of man. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. Because he has fixed the day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. 
Now that when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, but others said, we will hear you again about this. See, Paul went into Rome, I mean, not to Rome, he went into Athens, one of the greatest cities of human history, where everything was believed, everything was accepted, everything could go. If whatever lifestyle, whatever belief system, whatever you wanted, Athens was the cosmopolitan of the universe, and probably still is. There's probably no nation or society that exists that was like Athens. It was the greatest. It had Socrates and Plato, and it had all these great thinkers. And, and in that system, Paul walks into Athens, and he says, let me tell you about Jesus. Can you imagine Paul stepping into Athens, a highbrow city, and saying, let me tell you about the one that you're missing. Remember, there was a, they were so unsure about belief that they actually had a pillar for the unknown God. So Paul steps up right onto the unknown God pillar and says, let me tell you a little bit about the unknown God. You got all of them. You got the God of the water. You got the God of the ocean. You got the God of the sea. You got the God of... Paul said, let me tell you about the God that really does exist. And so he started. Read that, that passage he started, and he began to make his way to bring about the revelation of Jesus. See, God, think about this. If there was really a God, if there is a God, God would want you to know him. And that's what Christianity is about. It's about revealing, God revealing himself to us, right? Other faiths, they don't have a basis of who Jesus is. They don't, they don't, even, well, they don't believe in Jesus to begin with, but they don't have a basis of who God is. It's kind of like this external force. It may or may not be there. You got karma. You got things that are kind of rolling around. But Jesus would say straightly and strictly, listen to me here, for those of you who do, don't know and don't really believe Jesus who he is, he does present to you a problem because Jesus himself says this. He says, I am the way and the truth, and the life. Now, here's the catch. No one. Do you know what no one means? It means zero. No one. Nada. Nunca. Jamás. I like that jamás because it's like a novella. No one comes to the Father except through me. This is where I will insult many people, not intentionally, just being biblical. Not Buddha. Not a great shaman. Not Hinduism, not Islam. I know I'm putting myself on the line, probably get fired on Monday for my job. No one but Jesus Christ. You can agree with me or you can disagree with me, but it is life-changing. No one but Jesus Christ. He said it, guys. So if I follow the biblical Jesus, I either accept what he says or I get off the boat. And I'm okay with you getting off the boat because I'd rather you know when it comes to facing him for eternity that you rejected him willingly and understandably. Or that you accepted him with all faith. Hardcore, right? All right this, is, this is job threatening for me because one of the tenets that has introduced itself into the church is pluralism. Pluralism is a very popular concept in the academic world. It's just that everybody's the same and all of the things are equal. All religions are equal. All belief systems are equal. All cultures are equal. There's none better than the other and there's none superior than the other. Well, I'm here to tell you, great, a lot of that is true. A lot of things aren't people are people. God does say that we are all created sinners. So I'm going to agree with you on this academia. We're all sinners. They don't like that answer, though. They want to be all good. No, no. If you're going to do that, then yes, let's apply, apply a biblical idea of what that means. That means we are all sinners. If we're all sinners, apart from God, then we don't deserve the goodness of God. Does that make sense? Right? Someone comes and stabs your kid. Do they deserve your love? Do they deserve your goodness? No. That's logic. When we sin, what we really are saying to God is this. Sin is very simple. Sin is not complex. It's easy to understand. You don't really have to convince someone they're a sinner, even though they'll fight you about how good they are. But when you sin, it's simply this, right? It's saying, God, you're wrong. I'm right. That centralistic idea that we have in our culture. God, you're wrong. God, what you say about this, I don't like it, so I'm not going to do it. You're wrong. I'm right. In this part of life, 
You're, you're teaching me what I should be and me wanting to be what I want to be. Well, you're wrong about that. What you do then is you make yourself God. Listen to me. You make yourself God. That's what you do. That's the reality of that decision. You make yourself God when you say God is wrong. That's hard to chew on, isn't it? All of you out there that think you were good, I'm a good person, I'm a, I do good things, I do great things. If you don't agree with who Jesus is and who Christ is, that you are a sinner in need of a Savior, then you make yourself above Jesus. Get that, folks? You put, so why would you be surprised when you face God Almighty that he's going to say, who do you say that Jesus was? And you're going to say, well, he was a great guy. I mean, I don't know, his picture's everywhere. He's going to say, no. He was my son, and yet you rejected him and put yourself above him in your beliefs and practices. So why do you want to spend eternity with me? The Bible says, then he will say to you, depart from me. I never knew you. So you never got on with knowing God. He gave himself to us. He revealed himself to us. He has exposed himself to us in the person and the life of Jesus Christ, the Son. And he says, I want to know you in the fullness of who you are and in the humanity of who you are. But do you want to know me? And when you reject Christ, the alternative is to reject his kingdom, is to reject his truth, is to say that you're above God and you're better than God. And if you watch the newest versions of Noah and all these rewrites of the Bible, you're going to see that. They all believe in the, their essence. They're all saying in these new teachings in our culture is that we're gods and that we can make these decisions from pop singers to rap singers to all these people. They're saying we're God. We can make the choices and we can change the world and we can end this and we can end that and we can we put ourselves above God instead of below So I can know God through the Son. Here's what it changes. This is how understanding and rightly aligning yourself with the Scripture was. When I receive Jesus, there's a whole new truth to my life. I can know God now. Now I no, not that because most of the world will tell you you can't really know God. No, no, no. Christianity says you can know God. That should just blow your mind. I can know God through His Son. I receive redemption through the Son. In other words, my life becomes what it was meant to be. When you redeem something, you cash it in for what it was really worth. And what God says is, I made you awesome to serve me in my kingdom. And when you get redeemed through Jesus Christ, you get cashed in to what you were really made to be. Your definition of who you are. Then I made righteous in the Christ the Son. See, the only way you receive righteousness, it means to be right with God, is through Jesus Christ. Not through other things. I love when Christians use the word karma. It's kind of one of my pet peeves. Y'all have heard me. Christians talk about karma. I said, karma is not Jesus. It never is Jesus. It will never be Jesus. It's antithetical to Christianity. Why Christians use the word karma, I don't get. Because karma is about, when you heard Jesus say, you heard it said that an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And yes, that is, that's karma. Karma is an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Jesus is grace and mercy. Not karma. Grace and and mercy, we do not get what we deserve, and we get what we don't deserve. I fulfill God's plan for his kingdom through the Son. In other words, your life becomes the work of the kingdom of God. And I'm commanded to share this redemptive plan with everyone. That's the final part of this. When you understand that, when you align with that of who Jesus is, then you cannot do anything but preach the gospel. It is, a com it is a compelling thing within you to preach. Look what I'm doing, right? I'm preaching the gospel, right? And it's, my co it's compelling me. If you're not right with Jesus, if you're not right with God, you may, you may wonder why you struggle with sharing Christ. It's because you are not right with God. I'm going to tell you that right now. Because when you rightly sit with God, God compels you to share who he is, the goodness of who he is. Why would I not share a gospel message of a, how a loving God died for my sins, has given me redemption, and will work out my life in an eternal plan that is destined to eternal joy in heaven. Right? Whoa, right? Why, would I, why would I want to be quiet about that? Why would I want to shut up? And why would I, oh, your religion is for you and you alone. Why would I want to be silenced in knowing the truth of God? As a physician, if I know of a treatment that can get you well, it's a 
it's a malpractice for me to withhold from you treatment that will bring you life. And yet in the faith, we are told to shut up and to stay silent when there is a spiritual treatment that will bring you life. Are you getting it now? Are you getting the, the urgency of spreading the gospel? As we close, I want you to think about this. Do you align with Jesus of the Bible or do you align with the historical Jesus? Are you a pluralist and you believe every system is the same? Or have you understood now that what Jesus says is true, that I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me? Do you align with the Jesus of the Bible or do you not? It's a very simple question. Isn't it interesting that Jesus would be asking his disciples that very question? Who do you say that I am? And even the word I am is a beautiful relation to God when he comes on the mountain to Moses. And Moses says, who do I say sent me? And God says, I am has sent you. God is throughout scripture. He's here for you. He's died for you. If you're going to understand waves, if you're going to understand evangelical Christianity, and yes, we are being pushed to inappropriate beliefs, beliefs that are off the, to the side, but I can stand here with 100% confidence. I give you 100% confidence that this is the Bible, Jesus. There's no Sonny added in there, all right? Sonny's a coward. Sonny's got a waffler. He's, he's a non-confrontational guy, so I'd love to have a pluralistic Jesus because then I could just be hanging out and saying to everybody else, we're all cool. Your God is my God. We got the same God, just a different name. You've heard that. But the Sonny who subscribes to the Bible, no, Jesus is the way. And I've been asked that by people who are of other faiths, and I said, Jesus, it's Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And it will put you at odds. The Bible does say, when you take that stand, it'll say, even your mother and your sister and your brother will come against you. Because it is a stand. As Mario comes out, I'm going to let him close out in prayer. I, don't, I want you to understand that as we begin to teach in our classes, and it's very important that you come to these classes that we're going to have, these, these reass reconnecting things that we're going to be doing because you need to know the fundamentals of Christianity because tomorrow, guys, is not going to be the same as yesterday. We are in a new world in Christianity in the United States and in the West. Are you prepared? Are you ready?